Ai kuchil. Um, good morning. That's uh, how to say it. Ai kuchil atia enok. That's how to say it. it's a good morning today. Ai squechil atia enok. It's a good day today. Ai nishkwela kwen kwen kwenis kwenang a hela siamis chalacha. That um, that I, it feels really good to see you all today, and it gives me a great honor to int for, um, to welcome uh, to introduce the, um, our our dear elder um, Barb Hume to welcome us to the territory and to get us started in a good way today. So please, um, yes, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'll probably have to move this down a little bit. Uh, or I can do this. Um, anyway, uh, good morning. Um, as a Métis person and an uninvited person on these lands, I wish to acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples whom today we recognize as the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanic peoples whose historical relationship to these lands continue to this day. My name is Barb Hume, and I'm the Métis Elder over at First Peoples House. I'm originally from Treaty 1 Territory, which is the little postage stamp right around the city of Winnipeg. And I have a heritage which includes the Mackays, the Sinclairs, the Smiths, the Lizots, and a few more. And I've been a visitor on these territories for over 30 years. Uh, f more than 55 years ago, uh, I graduated as a nurse, and I was asking Catherine uh, what the actual process and what this day was all about, and it was talking about, as you see on your screen, about people who are, you know, having lived experiences as being a um, person who's just joining the schools or doing something beyond sort of what their expectations of their family. Well, I can include myself as one of those. So back in the early 60s, I was earning 25 cents an hour and I was saving all of my money so I could become a nurse. And I did. I became a nurse and then I thought there's more to being a nurse because also I wanted to see what the country looked like. And the country I wanted to look at was our country. So what I did in that circumstance was join the military. And I joined the military as a nurse for 28 years. And I was a very lucky person within that military environment in that it did care for me, it did protect me, and it did allow me opportunities for great learning. As a member of the military, I also had the chance of getting a Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Ottawa. The military was my support in addition to my family. And I would say for myself and for all of you, I'm going to share the teachings that are part of the Anishinaabe people. And part of that is the element of respect. And I would say respect for yourself and those around you are going to help each and every person on their journey. Looking at the wisdom that is being shared that you achieve through listening and talking and learning will also be important. Not only your own wisdom and the wisdom of your family, but the wisdom of theirs who share their time with you. The other thing that I would say that's really important within that is to be brave. And all of us sometimes feel that we're really not good enough, should be part of something, but be brave. Look at your own truth, recognize that you have value, that you're important, and that be honest in the fact that you know in many cases, and in most cases, you can do it and to recognize the importance of being able to do it. Also, some of us, when we get to that first step, sometimes feel that, oh, we got the world by the tail and we're gonna swing with it. But sometimes we have to look at ourselves and be humble and recognize that it takes a lot of people to make us 
walk on this journey and that we should recognize the importance of all of them as part of it. And I would say the last thing that is part of those seven Anishinaabe teachings is love. Not only love for yourself, love for your families, and love for all of those around you. The importance of love also carries on into the fact that we need to love all of those creatures of the land, sea, and air that are part of this journey that we fall, uh, that we're part of. And to, when you get a chance today, go out, listen for the birds, take a big breath of that beautiful air that we have surrounding us, and say thank you for the opportunity of living on these lands because they are precious and we need to care for them. And each of you are precious as well. And recognize that you're not alone on your journey, no matter what it is, that there are others around you that are there for the support and care and wishing you the best of luck, as do I for everybody. Thank you. Marci, Tleko, Haichka, Hai Hai, Hai Suska. Thank you to um, Elder Barb Hume for welcoming us to the territory um, and sharing these beautiful teachings to fill our hearts with uh, doing things in a good way. Um, we'd like to express you our uh, gratitude and give I can, with a small gift of a uh, token of our appreciation. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Lekongan speaking peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands, Songi, Sasquima, Oksanich peoples whose historical relationships to the land continue to this day. Uh, many thanks to all of you for coming. I'm Sue Yurbanzik, and I'm a co-organizer of the conference, and I'm the first person in my family to attend post-secondary. I'm a faculty member in Ling and a grateful settler here. I'm pleased to also introduce the other co-organizers to join me up on stage. I'm Catherine Legere and Colette Smart, and we'll take things from here to uh, just give you a little bit of an overview. Yeah, just to once ag uh, again acknowledge the territory where we are, grateful to be here um, on the Lekwungen speaking people's territory. So uh, my name is Colette Smart. I'm one of the co-organizers of uh, First in Class, and we wanted to share a bit about our journey, how we got here. Some of you know this story, some of you don't. Um, so this goes way back to fall 2018 um, when we started something called the Shoestring Initiative. So it was Catherine, Sue, myself, and a student from sociology, Elaine Laberge. Um, and this was really a grass movement, uh, a grassroots movement. Um, it was really just kind of um, from bottom up energy from students, other faculty. Um, and we really wanted to create a sense of community for students, so we focused on a lot of social events for students and bringing them together in connection. Um, and then this kind of evolved over time. Elaine graduated and moved on, and then in 2019, the three of us started to have conversations about whether we should do a mentorship program. We had all really benefited from mentors in our journey, and we felt really passionate about being able to start something here. Um, and so this is how we got to first in class. So we um, sp spent several years working on this idea for a mentorship program. And then finally, we were fortunate enough in 2022 that our dear president here uh, gave us some money, believed in our vision. Um, and what's really exciting, I think, about this program is there's several programs like this in the US. But as far as we are aware, this is the first of its kind in Canada. There's some peer-to-peer -peer mentoring groups like uh, at UBC, but in terms of a faculty peer mentorship program, as far as we're aware, this is the, the first one. Um, so our program, uh, we had a soft launch last year and then a bigger launch this year, and it really grew very quickly. So we have 50 faculty members who are involved and um, over 120 undergraduate and graduate students all across campus from all different faculties. 
Um, we've created a website. Some of you know about our website where you can learn more about us, read the mentors, bios, and find some other useful resources on first-gen students. And also, that's where we post about upcoming events. We usually try and have at least one or two events per semester. Some are student only, some are uh, faculty only, and some are faculty and student. Um, and all the mentors are first gen, former first gen students as well, so we have that shared lived experience. And so there's a common theme of mentorship that was key to our professional success. Um, I think we all felt really strongly the thing that helped us get to where we were, were having somebody that believed in us and had confidence in us and was willing to support our hopes and dreams and also ha help us navigate the confusing system of academia. So it's really about building a community of support and belonging, not only for students, but also other faculty who may continue to find challenges navigating academia. And that's what we found in our conversation with other faculty is they really appreciate the support as well. So why first gen? So we went back and forth a lot about, you know, how to conceive of this program and what label to give it. Um, and so these days we're talking a lot about equity, diversity and inclusion and we often hear uh, discussion about the notion of privilege. Um, but socioeconomic privilege is often something that seems to be left out of that conversation. Um, certainly this seems to be the case in Canada, like there's more discussion about this in the US in terms of other first gen mentorship programs. But we know from empirical research and probably Wolfgang is going to share some of this in his talk. Um, that students who come from lower SES backgrounds often face multiple disadvantages, including how they experience the university, whether they complete their degree, and also making those vital connections that will really help their future career prospects. So our hope is that uh, with this fledgling program, we could really um, put UVic on the map, at least in terms of Canada, for offering this kind of student support and um, that that will be a draw for first-gen students to want to come here and maybe other universities will be inspired to do something similar. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Catherine. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Catherine Leger. I'm an associate professor in the French and Francophone Studies Department. It's a pleasure to be here. This is D-Day. We've been planning this for quite a while. And I think we have an extraordinary program today. So um, after the words of welcome by the president, uh, there's going to be two plenary talks this morning, one by Wolfman Lehman and the other one by Alfred Lubrano. And at uh, 11.45, there's going to be a book signing. And also, we're going to serve lunch in this room. In the afternoon, uh, there's going to be a Q&A panel where five faculty members and staff are going to re well respond to questions asked by students, first generation students. Then uh, our third pl plenary talk by uh, Andrea Dittman. And uh, then there's going to be a workshop specially designed for students. It's on learning skills for students. And then we're going to conclude with a reception at the upper lounge, so right across the, the, the corridor here. Uh, please be advised that the conference is being video recorded, so we're going to put it up on uh, YouTube and probably other platforms uh, at a later date. And this afternoon, there's going to be a photographer here who is going to take photos, so please be advised that you might appear in media. <laughs> We'd like to thank a lot, a lot of people because this type of program uh, couldn't be run without a lot of people. We got the generous support of the Faculty of Humanities for a Lansdowne lecturer. We got another Lansdowne lecturer from the Social Science. I'm very happy for their support. We got the generous uh, financial support and moral support as well from Dr. Kevin Hall. We were very lucky, we feel very privileged. And also we'd like to thank our um, five panelists, so um, Rob Hancock, Violetta Yusub, Natasha um, Jamal, Yesaya Sin, Christine Sai, and Rose Vukovic, who's going to come here this afternoon. 
and I'm going to um, give the final um, floor to my colleague Sue. And I'm going <laughs> thank. I'm going to continue just to thank everyone who has um, supported this um, pro program and this event today. So many thanks to um, Dr. Asmita Sodi, uh, who's going to facilitate the workshop this afternoon, um, and to the many students who've helped the first in class to develop the mentorship program. Um, and some of them are here. Thank you so much for helping out today. Um, so Justine Belanger, Sian Dabrowski, Haley Ellis, Ray Fletcher, Sunny June, Jasmine Padam, Emily. Lisu and Cedric Trahan, um, and many students who've helped on the advisory panel, um, Niku Amini, Alison Chung, Erica Huang, Sonny Jun, Rachel de Molitor, Rosie Mann, uh, Nathan Eng, Jasmine Padam, Analia Purser, um, faculty members Nina Belmont, um, Brandon Howarth, Violetta Yusub, and also from Student Life and Engagement, Emily Hoon. And um, we've, we've just had our very first advisory panel, and we've already had so many great ideas moving forward and we're planning to have a more, many, many more of those to help guide us to, so that we have, a, 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 that we can really express and, and, and find out what this, how we can support students even more. Um, so thank you to the plenary speakers who are here today, who traveled far uh, um, uh, to, to share their knowledge, wisdom and, and life experience with us. Dr. Wolf Gang Lemon from the Western University in London, Alfred Lebrano from the Philadelphia Inquirer, and Dr. Andrea Dittman from Emory University in Atlanta. And to the bookstore, who has also helped us out a lot with the conference packages, which, are, were, which were compiled by all our, uh, everyone and the team. I wish, I wish you all a good conference and hope that the talks and discussion will raise awareness to these unacknowledged disadvantages that students have um, when facing, when moving into this different, different um, context. Um, and one of the things I never learned was how to, how to plan things well, so I have to go to my class right now. So, but before I do, I would like to introduce Dr. Kevin Hall, who will, who will also start us off in a good way. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody, and uh, I'm here to welcome you all on behalf of the university. If you've come from somewhere outside of UVic, welcome to our campus. I hope you have a great time. If you work on our campus, so thank you everybody for what you contribute to UVic. I wanted to also thank Barb for starting us off in a good way. Her welcome to territories are always so fantastic and personalized. And Barb contributes so much to this university as part of our elder circle that uh, it's just unbelievable the amount of time and effort and the contributions and knowledge and wisdom you bring to us, Barb. So thank you. It's always good to have you here. I thought I'd start off actually just saying my, um, my dad quit school when he was 13. He went to work in his uh, father's shoe repair shop. I was going to say business, but it was a one-person shop. And also to pursue his dream as a football player, and he did play in 1949 and 1950 for the Tottenham Hotspurs. Um, at that time, he didn't get paid to play. Um, my mom quit school when she was 14 uh, to go to secretarial school, and she was the smartest person I'd ever met. And in fact, she got her master's degree when she was 67 years old. So she became the second in family to go to university. So the first was me. At 18 years old, I packed my bags and jumped in a car and drove from uh, Peterborough, where I grew up, to uh, Queen's University, which is a great university, but probably wasn't the best for a first in family student to go to because it is a university that's just packed with people that have multiple generations of uncles and aunts and parents that went to Queen's. And I won't tell you too much about that because I don't want to bore you with my own story, but my parents, in fact, emigrated to Canada. I was born in the UK, but I came here when I was four or five, I think. They came here because they thought the kids would get a chance to go to school, which they wouldn't have done in the UK. We would have been put in the, the O stream, O levels or whatever it was. And interesting, four kids in my family um, all have university degrees. There's four bachelor's degrees, three masters, two PhDs. There's two academics, one high school teacher and a public school teacher. So we're all kind of committed to this piece around education. 
I thought I'd tell you about my first day at school because I got so many great experiences at Queens of being first in family, really not understanding what goes on at a university. But I walked into my first class. It was called Mathematics 110. It was differential equations. For those of you who like math and differential equations, it was pretty cool. And the professor walks in and goes, I'm Dr. Lee Sullivan. I'm sitting at the back of the class and I immediately go for the door and head out and I go back to the Faculty of Applied Science where I was and said, you've put me in the wrong class. There's a doctor here. I'm here to do math. And they went, well, no, hang on. This is like an academic. And so that was my experience at university. And nobody had told me what goes on at a university. Um, you know, the, the big part about being the first in family is often you don't have that family support. Um, your parents aren't used to university. And so certainly for me, that was a, a really part of an interesting journey. But I think it does build determination. And I, I really liked what Barb said about courage and being brave. And I think that for me, it worked. And that doesn't work for everybody, of course. Not everybody builds that sense of being courageous and brave. Um, and so that's an important thing to talk about that I think you will talk about. You know, when I look back, I feel content. I had a great academic career. I've ended up uh, at a great university uh, in a beautiful place in Canada. Um, I've contributed to my profession. I'm an engineer by training, and so I've done lots of contributions to my profession. And what I'm really proud of is the contributions into the community that I've made. And I've served on a number of organizations across the country, in Australia, where I lived. And so I look back, and I, I feel content. But it happened because I was able to go to university. And I think it was probably easier when I did it back in the 1920s, as opposed to, <laughs> supposed to elicit a laugh. I know, yeah, it was good. <laughs> but, um, but I think we are struggling now around things like what, what was my passion, which is access to education. And I'll come back and talk about that just in a second. I got like an hour, don't I, to talk? Is that what I never told you? I'm almost done. I, I wanted to turn to the universities in Canada. And I want to say for most universities, including you, Vic, we admit kids on the base, kids. We admit students on the basis of marks. Um, that's it. And most universities do that. We, and we take uh, it as a badge of honor to say, well, you know, in engineering, you now need 97% in high school. We don't look at who the students are. That's starting to slowly change. At UVic, we're trying to collect data on who do we have on our campus. We don't even know that. We hide behind the banner of privacy quite often. Oh, you know, the privacy commissioner won't let us collect this data. And we have to find ways around that. And we have at UVic. We're going to start collecting data on the composition of our students that come into the university. But first in family has never been on that list as well. It's, it's lots of other groups, deserving groups, um, but first in family isn't there. And so we're trying to, to see how we can work with that. And we're also at UVic trying to change our um, acceptance process so that we take into account people's backgrounds, people's lived experiences. And so we won't only admit on marks, but I think we've got a long journey to go with that. And I guess the last piece I'll say about universities is, is that really you know, again, we, we really cater in Canada, sadly, to traditional students, and those are high school leavers, as they are called in Australia. I don't think we call that here in Canada. I spent a lot of time in the Australian system. But 91 or 92 percent of our students here at UVic, and it's very common across the sector, come directly from high school, uh, as opposed to countries like Australia, where I spent many years working where my old university, Newcastle, 60% of the students were mature students. Mature being defined as students five years outside of their high school graduation or no high school graduation. And this is the part I wanted to get to. This is where access to education becomes important. Why do you have to have a high school degree if you're in your 30s or 40s to get back to university? And we do that to people. People say, oh, you know, I've decided I'm, I'm done with my career in construction. I want to become an engineer. I didn't finish high school, and we say, okay, well, go back and sit in a high school class with all those 16 and 17 year olds and finish your high school degree. Whereas many other countries, Australia included, develop what's called these pathway programs where you bring students into these new pathway programs, mature students, and give them the skills to be successful. And I hope we get there. So I just wanted to end on uh, UVic. I think we're extremely lucky and fortunate to have three individuals who were up here, standing here, to. Uh, uh, you know, Sue Collette and, Collette and Catherine for their vision, their shoestring initiative, what they've done on a shoestring budget, because they say we gave them some money, it wasn't very much money, 
But I think what they've contributed to UVic has just been incredible. The, the first gen mentorship program with over 50 academics involved and more than 120 students this year is just an incredible thing for this university. And it's gonna grow and it's gonna grow and it's gonna grow. So thank you to the three of you. Uh, it's, it's an amazing, uh, it's been amazing to watch this happen and unravel. So I'm um, really looking forward to today. And finally, thanks to, uh, to Wolfgang and Alfred and Andrea for coming uh, to UVic and enlightening us all today. And so now I'm gonna get off this stage if I can and uh, <laughs> have a great time today, thanks.